A rational fear contains strong, coarse language and traces of nuts. FBI Radio recommends listening by an immature audience. Tonight, Kylie Minogue reveals that her backup dancers quit because she doesn't pay them, which is why her Logie's backup dancers were all gambling addicts paying off their debts to Crown Casino. And Australia gives $12 billion to the United States to buy jet fighters with questionable stealth ability. Experts say if Australia really wanted planes that were undetectable, we should buy them from Malaysia Airlines. Joe Hockey tells Australia that we have to do the heavy lifting, so we get workout tips for Romanian deadlift champion Bob Carr! Yeah. Oh my goodness, fear. ladies and gentlemen, we're here. A rational Fear coming to you live from the Giant Dwarf Theatre in Redfern. It's very exciting. And of course on FBI Radio and FBIRadio.com around the world. Let's meet our fear mongers for tonight who will be taking comment. She's one half of FBI Radio's weekend breakfast program, Girls Gone Mild. Hannah Mae Riley, what's really wrong with the world? Short answer, Kenny G. Long answer, don't be so negative. You have to be the Grange you want to see in the world, right? Thank you. Excellent. He's one of Australia's best comedians, Greg Fleet. Why will you be making up the news tonight? Uh, because the news is depressing. I, uh, I recently read that India, uh, the Indian government has made homosexuality illegal. I think that's a, it's a terrible law. But on a lighter note, uh, in an effort to annoy India, Pakistan has made homosexuality compulsory. So, <laughs> in your face, India. A writer for Irrational Fear Digital and defender of the reasonable. So, James Colley, why are you defending Chris Kenny? Chris Kenny, well, I guess I'm just a dog person. <laughs> yeah, well done. On loan from Triple J, on stage from the Sydney Comedy Festival and on drugs from Greg Fleet, Lewis Hobber. Is the beatification of John Paul, II, John Paul II a rush job? It is a rush job, Dan. It's, it's claptrap, it's populist nonsense. I'm dismayed, I'm disheartened, and I'm starting to wonder if the church is becoming out of touch. <laughs> oh, big call. You're listening to Irrational Fear, now costing $14 more than a trip to your doctor because we're fully sick. <laughs> But first, this Anzac weekend just gone was a unique time for Australians. It's a unique time for reflection. Because now that the bicentennial is well behind us, we have so few holidays to turn the microscope on ourselves and ask us who we really are. Anzac Day is a day, it turns out, that we're a nation with a foundation of gambling, drinking and oat-based biscuits. <laughs> but for want of a better word, some say the celebration of Anzac Day has gone too far. One ex-army officer believes that Anzac Day is turning into a military Halloween. Oh, that's actually pretty cool. Um, imagine that. Ima imagine those parties. Hey, Lewis, who did you come as? <laughs> uh, Sir General Cosgrove, who are you? Colonel Sanders. Nice. <laughs> you want to go bobbing for medals? Sure. <laughs> But what Major Buzzkill here doesn't understand is that for a certain generation, Anzac Day was once about remembering old blokes who fought for wars that are the basis of some really amazing films. <laughs> <laughs> now, however, these days, um, because we're coming off the back of our longest engagement ever, our longest wartime conflict ever, Anzac Day is increasingly becoming about young people and the young people that fought for Australia. And young people all over are really engaged with Anzac Day. Because if Anzac Day is about looking at ourselves, no one knows about looking at themselves more than Generation Y. Yeah. Um, Anzac Day is a special day of selfie reflexation. Oh, sorry, <laughs> selfie reflection. Now, here's a few of our Anzac Day selfies that we found. Uh, when it comes to the ultimate sacrifice, Lemon Boots knows all about it. <laughs> Going to the dawn service sounded like a nice idea until I had to get up. Hashtag selfie, hashtag dawn service, hashtag so tired. Ah, <laughs> uh, Gen Y, sleep shall not weary them. <laughs> <laughs> Some army wives as well have been through very specialised basic training for the day. Off to Anzac Day Memorial Dawn Service with my man at the base. So early. Hashtag Dawn Service. Hashtag Army Girlfriend. Hashtag She Squads. Hashtag Bikini Bod. Hashtag Chicks That Lives. Hashtag Real Girls Lived. Hashtag Aussie Beach Babes. <laughs> yeah. 
The thing about that one, there's actually so many more hashtags we could have read out. Uh, <laughs> but I love that she's come back to add a couple more because, you know... Hashtag lest we forget, hashtag Anzac Day, hashtag Australian and New Zealand Army News Corp. <laughs> Did you so, say Army News Corp? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no. You've they got pay me well. <laughs> Murdoch runs wars now? And she's clearly read the first lot and gone, oh, I sound like a vacuous twat. <laughs> <laughs> I read, okay? What I love about this one is that uh, her, friend, you, her friend Udistan popped in for a comment of his own. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Except for the bits at the end. <laughs> but when it comes to the ultimate reflection of how young people feel about war, I think JG Jessen really nails it with this one. Hashtag all night. Hashtag dawn service. Hashtag party. No fucks. <laughs> I really hope that was a tally of all his fucks of the night. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, I think those guys were on the Anzac spirit till at least 3 a.m. Definitely. Um, <laughs> So how do you get a generation, a young generation, who is so of the now to look beyond Afghanistan? Uh, um, it's a simple way, speak internet. Um, here is how probably Upworthy would report on World War I. This group of soldiers got sent to the wrong beach to die. And you won't believe what happens next. <laughs> At one minute, you'll shit yourself. It's true. It's true. Now... Fear mongers, how would you spin your war of choice in internet speak? How would you do that, Hannah? Well, as a young person, I always connect to um, a clickbait quiz. And oh, I thought maybe a quiz could go like, can has syphilis. Take our quiz to see how many venereal diseases you have in common with a Tennessee Civil War soldier. <laughs> the results may shock you and probably leave you infertile. Uh, <laughs> somehow I always end up with Portland. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. Lewis. I'd, I'd quite like to just learn about the death toll through emoji. <laughs> Sad face. Open mouth. Dancing woman. Explosion. <laughs> Carly, have you got one? Yeah, I think if Wilfred Owen tweeted, he would have been much more succinct. You know, here we lie in Flanders Field, tweet one of 17. <laughs> Ends up he got through 15. <laughs> Greg Fleet, how would, you, uh, how would you sell the war through internet speak? Uh, probably like, great war, bullshit, more like shit war. I got blown up twice. Hashtag, this war is shit. <laughs> Very succinct. Now, when it comes to conveying a message in a succinct way, like Greg... The Sorry, can I just point out that was exactly the right number of characters? It was kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit haiku. <laughs> Now, when it comes to being selling a succinct message like Greg, no one knows how to do that better than the world of advertising. The commercialisation of Anzac Day started a few months after, after the diggers actually landed in Turkey. Now, it should be noted, back then, you had to get permission from the Attorney General to use the name Anzac. Uh, here's a couple of early ads from 1916. Now, guys, I'm going to play these ads for you, or show you these ads. Can you tell me whether these were approved by the Attorney General or unapproved? Let's have a look here. Here is uh, Anzac Toast from Cops Brewery. Was that approved? Not approved, Dan. That one was not approved. Correct. Not approved. Yeah. Oh, no. My God. No. Had yeah, a good feeling. Also, have the script, so uh, yeah. know the answers. Very good. What about this one? Uh, how do you feel about this one, the Anzac Gollywog Company? Because if we've learned anything from Hey Hey It's Saturday or Chris Lilly is that Australians love laughing at foreigners. Uh, oh, Gollywog biscuits. We shall hopefully forget them. <laughs> God, approved. I want to see a dog Anzac, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with not approved, Dan. Approved. Uh, not approved. No, right. And no Hannah, you have the script. <laughs> <laughs> Arnott's Biscuits, approved or not approved? Uh, approved! Yeah, they were approved! Oh, no, yeah, mention they were approved answer. because um, they didn't have the word Anzac in them. Now, these days, you still actually need permission uh, from uh, the government to use the word Anzac, uh, but kind of companies are going to try it on anyway, and they've been trying it on by just trying to refer to Anzac Day. Whether you're Qantas and you're trying to sell champagne to your frequent flyers, or you're in the business of buying internet domains. Isn't that great, isn't it? Because, yeah... Our boys died in World War I so we could internet. Anzac sale. Uh, <laughs> they're going fast. <laughs> <laughs> the fucked up thing about this is all the German oh, domains took soon. all the Polish <laughs> domains. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what about this one? This is from this year, trying to sell plastic surgery. <laughs> I don't know if you can read that. It reads, Anzac Day mateship experience. Absolutely. Isn't that incredible? Boobs, not bombs. That's what's You'll uh, be too beautiful to die. <laughs> 
Now, some companies, they managed to cash in on the Anzac legacy without actually using any words at all that reflect a war or the word Anzac, like this awesome uh, ad from McDonald's from 1999. <laughs> How much is that, love? Nothing, it's free. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> you know, that, that, that waitress is so rude, he was actually crying because he had to drink McDonald's coffee. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the problem there. <laughs> and he, he hadn't actually been in the war, he'd just been to the, to the uh, Sydney show and won a few <laughs> things. He was just going, why has my life degenerated into an uncontrollable farce? <laughs> <laughs> now, today, brands cash in by commemorating the diggers instead, like VB. Now, see if you can spot the logos in this TVC. Back in 39, before the war, I was in the cycle club, and one day they came to me and they said, we're going to join the army. They said, we're you know, and so if you're going to join it, I'll go and jo join you too. And this one here on the corner, it's myself. Now, I never saw them again. I saw one of them. I met him in the bus. They, 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 lost, they lost a lot. They're all gone. Greatest lot of blacks I've ever met in my life. Look, look, all, all right. It is a pretty wow. nice campaign. It's very nice. It's very nice. In fact, uh, VB helps to raise uh, lots of money for the legacy in RSL. I think since 2009, they've raised about $5 million, which is really great. Um, but considering the Rudy Hill RSL, made $43.2 million just from pokies in 2010. Um, maybe VB should just advertise pokies. <laughs> be, be a lot easier, be a lot easier. Those, yeah. That ad too could be, you know, like a modern day version of that before Afghanistan. It'd be like, yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> I was working on uh, Home and Away and I uh, came into work one day and they said, are you going to join the army? And I said, fuck no, I'm earning heaps of coin doing this and it's not dangerous, so no. <laughs> I'm fucking staying on the telly. Yeah. No, Alf's pretty hardcore. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Alf would go yeah. and he'd be back in the <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> what have you been up to, Alf? Oh, flaming hell, killed a few foreigners and I'm back. <laughs> in time for the lunch shift. <laughs> <laughs> That VB campaign is actually quite nice, though it is a bit more, you know, uh, causation marketing than philanthropy. Um, it's hard to be cynical about that campaign, but we're a rational fear, and being cynical is our job. Rational fear. Back in 08, before it all went down, I was in an office mixed netball team with a few of the boys. A few good lads in there. Then we got the call, the one every mother with a son in advertising dreads. They wanted us to associate an alcohol brand with Anzac Day. And the next thing we knew, we were in a brunch meeting at CUB. I remember Steve pitched in to get Bacardi Breezes associated with Anzac Day in 2007. <laughs> he didn't make it. He didn't spend it yet. We lost him. I think he moved to DDB. The people told us there was no way. Using the Anzac legacy to promote an alcohol brand, that's completely tasteless. And as soon as I heard tasteless, I just thought, Phoebe, raise a glass. It just made sense. Especially since one in three serving members of the armed forces have experienced an alcohol-related disorder at some point in their lives. For VB, our challenge was, how can we make it three in three? Alcoholism, the most common mental health problem for Vietnam vets. Looking back, I'd like to think maybe we had a hand in that. And that's what I'll remember today. Simon Chilvers. Ladies and gentlemen, James Colley! Now, um, before James does his bit, if you've got children in the car, you're at home with children near a radio, uh, you've got children anywhere, if you, have, if you don't like foul language, just turn off the radio for about five minutes. What Dan is saying is um, James Colley is not legally allowed near children. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. James Colley. All right, here we go. I'm here today to talk about Chris Kenny. Now... 
Before I begin, I have been advised to note that what follows is my opinion as that term would be understood pursuant to section 31 of the Defamation Act 2005, and that my bank balance is currently $17.72. Now I can talk about Chris Kenny. If you do not know Chris Kenny or you're legally obliged to pretend you do not know Chris Kenny, he is the man currently suing the Chaser and the ABC over a photoshopped image in which Mr. Kenny is seen to be engaging in a sexual act with a pooch. It feels appropriate to perform this at Giant Dwarf as depending on the outcome of that case, Mr. Kenny may soon own this venue. <laughs> Everything should stay the same though, except erotic fan fiction might do a 101 Dalmatian special. But I come not to bury Chris Kenny, but to praise him. In my opinion, as I've been told to say, Chris Kenny is Australia's greatest journalist. He says the things other people are afraid to say just because they're inaccurate and wrong. His articles are rip-roaring reads, completely untouched by all those boring facts and truth. As a commentator, Kenny primarily writes opinion pieces for the Murdoch Press, and you can tell he's the best at it. When you see other opinion columnists, each week they'll have a new topic to have an opinion on, but not Mr. Kenny. No, Mr. Kenny realized there's only one opinion worth having, and it is that the ABC is biased and has too much money. And as a former Liberal Party staffer, I believe Mr. Kenny would know what he's talking about when he says something is biased and has too much money. <laughs> Now, before speaking about the case, it's important for me to acknowledge two things. Number one is I am not a lawyer, but I do sometimes pretend to be a lawyer when I'm defrauding people. <laughs> the second is that the opinions I'm about to express are my own and no one should be held responsible except for Dan Illick, who has much more money than me and would be way more worthwhile to sue. Can I go on the record as saying they're my opinions? I haven't heard them yet, but so far, so good. So, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> now, while I cannot guarantee my information on the case will be entirely correct, I can guarantee anyone who could correct me is legally obliged not to comment. <laughs> as far as I know it, Mr. Kenny claims his reputation has been damaged irreparably. And I believe it's truly unfair that there was nothing Mr. Kenny could do to prevent this situation. I mean, at first you'd think it's no big deal. It was a three second joke in the hamster wheel, which receives about 800,000 viewers. But unfortunately for Mr. Kenny, the only way he could defend his reputation was to create national headlines by suing the chaser. <laughs> this then exposed his humiliation to 20 times its initial audience, just to limit the damage. As far as I can see, this case can be argued on two fronts, the literal and metaphorical, and as a fan, I will argue both. <laughs> to argue it from the metaphorical point of view, Mr. Kenny would have to say that calling him a dog fucker is a way of saying he is a low and bad person. But that really depends on the person and depends on the dog. <laughs> there are good Danes and there are great Danes. <laughs> and it... It doesn't make you a low person. Catherine the Great was widely to believed to have engaged in sexual intercourse with a horse, but she's not known as Catherine the Great at horse fucking. <laughs> so maybe if people accuse you of, a of being a dog fucker that makes them think of you as a low and contemptible person, it might be because you were already a low and contemptible person and fucking a dog is just the first interesting thing you've ever done. <laughs> Allegedly. The other side of this the cha is that is the literal, which is my favourite, because the cha it would be that the chaser were literally saying that Chris Kenny actually has, will, or is currently going carnal on a canine. <laughs> now, the thing with suing the chaser, you have to get around the larrikin defence. Them boys have gone away with some serious crimes just by playing the larrikin defence, and not just the ones you know about. Think about it. Regulars of this show will know no one benefited from Molly Meldrum's accident more than Chris Taylor. <laughs> I will never work in this town again. 
But we now get to my absolute favourite part of the Chris Kenny case. As far as I can tell, if Chris Kenny wishes to argue that the chase are, er are implying that he literally rolls over Beethoven, <laughs> he needs to suggest that that is not in and of itself absurd which means he will have to have his own legal representation argue that it would not be absurd for the average person to believe Chris Kenny is capable of sex with a dog. His lawyer will stand in front of the court and say, no, it's entirely possible that my client would have sex with a dog. That could happen at any moment. Keep an eye on your pets. <laughs> And if Mr. Kenny's lawyer manages to successfully argue that Chris Kenny could indeed fuck a dog, maybe, just maybe, Chris Kenny's reputation can be saved. <laughs> it's already having an effect too. If you read the first line of Chris Kenny's Wikipedia page, and this is true, I checked it the other day. It reads, Chris Kenny, born 1962, is a commentator, author, former political advisor from South Australia and dog enthusiast. <laughs> Thank you, I shall see you in court. <laughs> James Colley. There's a case Stormed in it in. I've challenged them over their funding and bias. They show me up a dog. Now, given that um, taking oh. a defamation case against the ABC and the chaser has made his name synonymous with dog fucking, um, what <laughs> other route could have Chris Kinney gone down on? Uh, gone down. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, How else could he have done it? Cats. <laughs> but then again, that's not even defamatory because no one would believe that because cats have a discerning mind, whereas dogs <laughs> would just go for anyone, really. <laughs> Cat person, Adam <laughs> Riley. Lewis? <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm generally fully in favour of it. I really agree with James. I'd never heard of Chris Kenny before this. And now I'm like, I'm a huge fan and enthusiast. And I think I'm going to start fucking some dogs. He's a, he, he's a dog household name. <laughs> I reckon this is just another case of uh, New South Wales, Victoria kind of rivalry. Because I don't care what anyone says, Andrew Bolt fucks a lot more dogs <laughs> than Chris Kenny. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Well, actually, what is really disturbing to me is not Chris Kenny having sex with a dog. That's, that's just kind of logical. What, <laughs> what is disturbing to me is the idea of Chris Kenny having sex with a human. <laughs> that's like, ugh. That human's a real, live person. The views of Greg Fleet do not represent FBI <laughs> or <a> National <laughs> Fit. Now, no for the next question uh, panel, there are two things to keep in mind before we do this. This theatre is owned and operated by The Chaser. For now. So anything we say here is probably their fault. Um, <laughs> and you can't defame someone who's dead. So, having said that, if you could defame anyone, oh. who would it be and why? Oh. <laughs> this feels like a trap, I'm going to say. <laughs> it really does. Do you work for Chris Kenny? No. But then again, that would be defamatory to you. <laughs> so I can say without doubt that I fuck dogs with all of the guys from The Chaser. <laughs> <laughs> They fucking love it. And in a way to further my career, I once bought a dog suit and hung out with a chaser. And <laughs> I, saw Shakes, I saw Shakespeare finger a cat once. <laughs> He's dead. I once went skiing with a Corey St. Bernardi. That was, um, <laughs> that was good. You're listening to Irrational Fear. Investigative humorism, doggy style. Hey, 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 rational Fear. Your fear is rational. Latest stealth fighter, heavier, slower, and more sluggish. Like the deadliest animal, the slug. This is the F-35 Lightning Stealth Bomber. Described by experts as risky, keeps me up at night, a disaster. The Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II is built for maximum efficiency. So its parts will regularly detach without warning. Not even the pilot can see what's fallen off because they can't look behind. Look out, terrorists. The F-35 is called lightning for a reason. To remind pilots when they can't fly. But if they do fly during a storm, the F-35 could explode at any time, turning into a giant flying bomb. 
The F-35 is a fine bomb too. With the F-35, there's no turning back or turning at all. This little jet can't turn at high speed. Hey enemy, the F-35 is coming for you, provided you're flying straight ahead. When it comes to only flying parallels, the F-35 is unparalleled. So fast, it's only taken two decades to build and is only seven years behind schedule. The Australian government is spending $12.4 billion on 58 of these flying death slugs. They're more important than any school or hospital. You can't put missiles on a school and you can't use a hospital to break up a Pakistani wedding. With the F-35, Australia now has the power to dominate its neighbours. Like Vanuatu. Get ready, Vanuatu, because we're gonna blow your Vanuatu hats right off. Oh, you're gonna get it. <laughs> Tanner May Riley! Scientists were stunned last week when a wild male monkey was recorded for the first time tenderly embracing his mate as she lay dying face down after accidentally falling out of a tree. So let's be clear, she was a completely incompetent monkey and probably needed to die, but aside from that, this story kicked me right in the feelings. It just touched me to see this wild creature living in the brutality of the natural kingdom show such compassion and humor. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Turns out he was just having sex with her dead body. <laughs> now, I'm a generally optimistic person, but in researching what to discuss with you tonight, I waded waist deep through the news without the help of concave abdomen defined by deep cut obliques. And this story, like so many others, has broken me like the fragile neck of that lady monkey. So, <laughs> too soon. So as a child of the Buzzfeed era, I will share information with you in the only way I know how, a poorly strung together list of things I've found on the internet. <laughs> Welcome to top five dopest news stories from last week that will totally crush your spirit. One, human equivalent to an armpit fart, Kyle Sanderlands, compared, <laughs> compared being blocked from meeting their royal highnesses, Kate and Will, to Tiananmen Square. However, he only did say this because he thinks Tiananmen Square is the name of the game he likes to draw on the back of napkins when he's lonely, <laughs> which is always. <laughs> Number two. In South Australia, the lawyer of a multi-million dollar drug kingpin described his client as having almost all the Anzac type traits. Some would say it was abhorrent to parallel this baseless criminal to a legacy of national heroes two days before Anzac Day. But it actually reminded me of the great Banjo Patterson poem. The metal that a race can show is proved with shot and steel. And now we know what nations know. Snitches get stitches, son! <laughs> Number three. An unexploded artillery bomb from World War II was found next to the recreation tent on Nauru. <sighs> Replied Scott Morrison, wait, what? Since when have we had a recreation tent? <laughs> no, 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 no. He later admitted the stray explosive was just a pretty misguided attempt to make detainees feel more at home. Oh, yeah. Four. Salient, and salient, that joke was salient. It was good, it was a good joke. <laughs> Four. Our new premier, Mike Baird, who apart from being anti-abortion and against heroin injecting rooms, pff, there goes my weekend, <laughs> hopes, <laughs> hopes to improve healthcare by privatising our hospitals. So I know that next time I black out after having that recurring daymare, I'm getting a breast exam from Christopher Pine, I'll get the same compassionate customer service that the private sector is known for. Finally, number five. On March 25th of this year, our Prime Minister, Anthony John Abbott, became stuck in a revolving door. <laughs> it's true, it's right there. And worse still, did anyone give this man a pat on the back when he eventually escaped from that door? No! Tall poppy syndrome corrodes this great nation once again. <laughs> this just proves that we are well and truly in our Bush era. And if that looks anything like his paintings, we are in for some blurry, discoloured, bad at doing Asian eyelids times. <laughs> But to leave you with some small hope tonight, the scientist observing the marmoset Romeo and Juliet that I spoke of earlier 
proposed that the sexual actions of the male could have been an attempt to wake the female. He was just trying to hump the light back into her fading monkey eyes. Oh, swappy non-consensual dagger. <laughs> Which said to me, maybe things aren't so sinister. Maybe we're all just trying to do our best. Whether that best is saying world heritage zones be damned or becoming the apex predator of racism under the guise of free speech or just learning how a door works. <laughs> I'll try to remain positive, but some days the headlines just seem to read, arms build up, buys planes, world is fucked. <laughs> Thank you. A rational fear! Hannah Mae Riley. It does seem a bit dismal. It sounds like we are in a bit uh, in kind of dismal times. The government has already abolished the Climate Commission, defunded the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, despite the world's smartest people saying that climate change is a real thing um, and possibly irreversible. I don't recall Andrew Bolt saying that. <laughs> Do you think that ignoring climate change is quite possibly the most rational strategy to deal with climate change? Well, I, it's got to be. It's, it is rational. Like, I think there are, that climate change deniers are well outnumbered by climate change acceptors and mover honorers. <laughs> well, I've always wondered if a polar ice cap melts and only George Brandis is there, did it ever happen? <laughs> and I've got to say, if science was important, there'd be a minister for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> here, here. And I just like to say yes, yeah. So, <laughs> what he said. Uh, some, uh, some people, well, Republicans definitely feel that, that the royal recent royal visit is a sign that the world is fucked. Do you guys think that uh, a couple of British backpackers on vacation negate the need for discussion on who rules this country of ours? I absolutely love him being here because in a few short years, like in a few decades, that will be the, one of the most powerful people in the world. And we can all say, yeah, but I saw him shit his pants. <laughs> I think yeah. we should have done what we do with, uh, with most foreign backpackers. We should have just taken them to Belangolo State Forest and just gone, this is what we do to your people. <laughs> yeah. Wow. At least they're a legitimate royal couple too, not like a Danish prince and some chick from Hobart. <laughs> <laughs> Like most things that the other government is saying, they appear to be doing the opposite. They claim to be champions of free speech. At the same time, stop information about boat arrivals, ban organised boycotts of environmentally friendly, environmentally damaging products, uh, criticise journalists for asking questions that lack home team affection. They gave the job of the top dog at the Human Rights Commission to a bloke who argued for its abolition. And this month, they've put limits on what public servants can say online in their own personal social media feeds. Um, but to soften the blow, they actually released a video just, you know, to get people through it. As a public servant, you should know that the government have made changes to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet's social media policy. Any post that's critical of the department, the minister or the Prime Minister is a no-no, even if it's from a personal or an anonymous account. But we want you to know that we would never encroach on your right to be a bigot. So, when you're upset at work and you want to tell the world, please, make it racist. Unacceptable criticism of the public service sector will be punished. Please, make it racist. That's more like it. <laughs> Haven't you forgotten something? Wow. Now you're getting the hang of it. <clears throat> Whoa, don't go too crazy. If you see someone using their freedom of speech to complain, use your freedom of speech to dob them in. It's only right, because you have the right to free speech, but only if you're a bigot. I just said we had bad coffee. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Greg Fleet. Now, uh, 
this is kind of something different uh, for our show. This is the first time we've done this segment. This segment is called Impro News, where Greg Fleet will make up the news. I have a dream. <laughs> um, so I've just quickly squiggled down some topics that okay. um, we, could, we could just throw at you. So, Greg Fleet, are you ready to do the news? Oh, yeah. I'm All right, here we go. Here we go. All right, this is it. Impro News with Greg Fleet. Take it away. Uh, f- first topic for the Impro News, mm-hmm. the Logies. Uh, the Logies were today made illegal. Uh, in a decision handed down by world governments, it was decided that rewarding people for average work on a populist level rather than a peer-voted system is outdated and ridiculous. Uh, Clearly, I've never won one. (laughs) Second topic, ICAC. ICAC. And a lot of things that I find amusing. Uh, 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 of course, ICAC, the International Council for Ants and Chimneys. Uh, uh, this week decided that uh, the allowing of ants to climb up chimneys in the summer months is not a health hazard to the ants. Uh, it is unlikely that most houses would have a fire burning in the summer and therefore any type of insect life may crawl unheeded up and down a chimney. In winter, although it is ultimately a matter of uh, personal choice, it has been decided to make it illegal uh, because depressed ants or insects may in fact use it as a way to end their meaningful and hard-working lives. (laughs) I'm Greg Fleet. This is the news. What was it called? The Internet... What was it? International (laughs) Council for Ants and Chimneys. It's a sweet council. (laughs) Time for finance. The Australian dollar is now replacing the Monopoly dollar as possibly the most amusing of all fake notes. Uh, After doing away with the one and two dollar notes, the government decided what the fuck and just got rid of all the notes. Uh, However, they are bringing back one cent coins, uh, just so that the very wealthy may weep. Weep openly, long. Uh, rich people uh, will no longer have money. Uh, however, they will still get to keep racism, and that's a trade-off. Uh, that is a trade-off. Don't worry. Don't be upset. None of you are rich. If you were, you wouldn't be here. You'd be at home counting your one-cent pieces. And in sport, Jeff Hugel found with cocaine. Jeff Hugel has turned out to be the only member of the Australian Olympic team found without cocaine. Uh, it was an error made by a very stoned clerk. Uh, Jeff Hugel uh, actually was found with cocaine. Uh, he was found with cocaine, uh, silver nitrate, uh, amyl nitrate, and three other of Bob Geldof's children. Uh, uh, which... I Sorry, that, to be honest, I was... I literally, that wasn't... It obviously wasn't a dig at the tragedy that happened recently. I was just trying to think of a celebrity with weirdly named children. And I kind of chose the wrong one. Uh, <laughs> but I kind of felt weirdly that none of you went, hey, because you kind of you understood that I am a decent person who has had a hard life. <laughs> and finally, in lighter news, Eddie Maguire drops the C-bomb. In lighter news, after burning his hand very badly with a Bic, (laughs) Eddie Maguire went, oh, cunt, that hurts. Uh, Are we allowed to say that? Probably not. Uh, Not on on community radio, you can't. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry, Edward Maguire. Uh, uh, I thought, really, I thought the lighter news deserved more. Uh, You know, burning his hand with a Bic, it's lighter... (laughs) Oh, yeah, keep digging. Uh, Stop drilling, kid, you've hit oil. Um, No, uh, Eddie Maguire did, in fact, drop the C-bomb. He dropped it after realising he'd done an entire football commentary without once being racist. Uh, He was furious at himself and he swore never to let that happen again. Mm, I think we've got time for one more. Yeah, oh, yeah. (laughs) We just keep going till we go out on a high. (laughs) Badgeries Creek. What was it? Badgeries Creek. Badgeries Creek. Channel 10, in a last-ditch attempt to win the ratings, have announced plans for a sweeping new drama series. (laughs) 
called Badgeries Creek. <laughs> it will be part neighbours, part Chris Pine, part Creek, <laughs> and part really non-stop annoying questions, and part Badger. Uh, thus bringing in an English viewership which promises overseas sales. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Greg Fleet! Hey, hey, a a <laughs> Only one man has the balls to follow up Greg Fleet. It is Lewis Hubbard! <laughs> What you'll get under us are, are tax cuts without new taxes. Uh, good evening. Hello. Um, you don't have to reply to that. Don't worry. It's a rhetorical question. I got this. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Yesterday was a big day for awards night celebrating once great institutions. Firstly, the Logies, which awarded Australia's highest honour to Scott Cam, a man I am told is on television. <laughs> the other ceremony took place at a little place called the Vatican, where Pope Francis made saints out of Pope John Paul II and Pope John XXIII. Now, normally, I don't get involved in papal matters unless the Pope specifically requests my thoughts. But I'm gonna throw my oversized and pointy hat in the ring this time because I'm seething at Pope Francis. For hundreds of years, there's been one way to become a saint, perform two miracles. It was simple, we all knew what we had to do, and if we wanted to get our name on the giant honour board in the sky, that was it. A proper miracle, you know, something like turning water into wine, or parting the ocean, or like St Nicholas, finding three young boys in a barrel and bringing them back to life. Sure, no one asked St Nicholas how he knew exactly where to find the young boys had been stuffed into a barrel. It doesn't matter now, they're all fine in the end. Or what about the miracle of St. Joseph of Cupertino, who flew? That's right, his miracle was unassisted flight. The man could hover whenever he wanted. So, you ask, what were the miraculous feats performed by our two newest saints? Medical miracles. Did they part any waters? No. Did they fly? No. They didn't even cure cancer. They were neurological disorders. Well. Well, I say Catholicism is suffering from a neurological disorder all of its own, and it's bullshit miracles. <laughs> there was a time when saints were awesome. Saint Ignatius got carted around the Roman Empire in chains, surrounded by the lions who would eventually eat him. That's fucking saints, man. Killed by wildlife. Am I the only one thinking Saint Steve Irwin? <laughs> But Pope John Paul II is a saint because a nun said she prayed to him when she had Parkinson's and it went away. A nun. I mean, vested interest much? <laughs> asking a nun if something's a miracle is like asking a Labrador if it wants dinner and a belly rub. The answer's always yes. And not only were these new saints' miracles unprovable and disappointing when compared to hovering, they also only had to perform one miracle. One miracle! Every saint from Peter onwards has, has to do two. But these ex-popes only had to perform one and it was pretty half-assed. <laughs> Expecting twice the reward for half as much work. Isn't that just typical of old people these days? <laughs> Although to be fair, to be fair, even though it wasn't counted, I would say that John Paul II's uh, hiding of all those sexual abuse claims for as long as he did was pretty close to a miracle. <laughs> Yeah, it turns, out, uh, it turns out our Pope has been fast-tracking sainthoods left, right and centre. Heaps of people have only had to do one miracle. Three saints have had to do no miracles. They're giving saint swing to our souls that have done zero miracles. You know who else has done zero miracles? This guy. <laughs> Although, I eat what I want and I still manage to keep this figure, which is <laughs> pretty close to a miracle, am I right, ladies? What is going on? It's like Catholics forgot they have a rule book. They do. It's a bestseller. <laughs> For 2,000 years, the rest of us have been forced to obey those rules, but the one time it starts to apply to them, it's all, oh, Catholicism isn't about the rules. Sometimes you just like to kick back and relax and say to hell with it all. Except they can't say hell because that's in the book! <laughs> 
The Pope said that his fast-tracking of popes to saints was part of a move to stop people thinking of saints as mystical and just more like regular role models. Wrong, Popey! We don't need any more role models! That's what we have minority actors for. Now, I'm... I'm very... I am... They're an inspiration. Now, I'm very worried that this Pope is trying to make Catholicism a logical and moral belief system set in the real world without forcing usually rational people to believe that the ability of humans to cure diseases from beyond the grave. And none of us want that. And the only way to stop it from happening is to only award sainthoods to acts of wonder performed by superhuman magicians who can fly. Otherwise, we'll all have to celebrate the everyday miracles, like a sunrise. <laughs> boo. Or a baby smile. Oh, boo. It's so boring. And boring saints make shit stained glass windows. <laughs> Kids are going to look up in churches expecting to see a being being torn apart by a lion or a dude flying and instead they'll just see some balding white guy in a white coat standing near a hospital bed going, I don't know how we did it but I guess it went into remission. <laughs> Boo! Some Catholics are asking that saintly miracles be extended to divorced couples reuniting. I know, that system is wide open for rotting. Just marry someone, divorce, get back together a month later, bam, you're both saints. I mean, how are Catholics who have a marriage that just works going to feel about that? Pissed. Pissed and Catholic, which traditionally is a bad combination. I mean, if you knew what you're doing, you'd get married, get divorced, get back together, become a saint, get divorced again, and then clean up by telling all the women you know that you're a fucking living saint. Look, if you still don't believe that the standards for sainthood have slipped, try this one on for size. Last year, Pope Francis made 813 people a saint in one day. I can't tell if that's impressive or lazy. <laughs> like, did he re research all of them and decide they all deserved it? Or did someone just give him a really big list and he went, oh, fuck that, give it to all of them. <laughs> just get me a goblet of Jesus wine. Pope's tired. <laughs> I mean, what the hell, Pope? Is this the beginning of some kind of beatification bonanza? Because St. Sylvan was beatified for having a body that didn't decompose for 1,500 years. Maybe it's time for a St. Bryn Edelston. I mean, it's... it seems unlikely that she'll break down easily. Then maybe you should make saints out of all of the St. Kilda football team, especially the ones who sent pictures of their dicks to a high school girl. I mean, if we've learned one thing from John Paul II, it's that being part of a team who likes sexual interactions with the underaged is no hindrance to sainthood. Oh, yes! Yes! I know I've made one too many sexual abuse jokes. I know it, but I went with that one anyway. Even though it was an AFL reference and I knew you wouldn't get it, I said it anyway. And that's exactly the kind of bravery that this church is giving away sainthoods for! <laughs> Saints should mean something. It shouldn't be a pointless honorific you just give away like sir or dame. <laughs> I don't know, guys. You know, maybe miracles just aren't what they used to be. I guess sainthoods are destined to just get shitter and shitter each year, just as the Logies are destined to get shitter and shitter each year. Just don't be surprised when you hear that Pope Francis has bestowed sainthood on Scott fucking Cam. <laughs> because it wouldn't be the first time Christians lost their shit over a carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis Hubbard! <laughs> now, New South Wales is renowned for having a new premiere every three weeks. Uh, given that Mike Baird was sworn in just a week ago, here is a little primer for what the next fortnight will hold. <laughs> People of New South Wales, our darkest time is over. For too long, our state has been mired in controversy, corruption, and conservative leaders who aren't from the northern beaches. But no more. Our hero has arrived. His name, Mike Baird. The hottest premier since Thomas Waddell. Mmm, Waddell. Mike Bruce Baird. A treasurer like no other. In that other treasurers would be expected to look after the authority for land tax, gaming tax, 
payroll tax, public service superannuation and the Office of State Revenue. But not our Mike. No, our Mike was too busy being an excellent treasurer to perform all the duties of being a treasurer. So these sectors were handled by Greg Pearce. With someone else doing his job, Baird finally had time for his hobby, cutting $19 billion from the public sector, which is great because hospitals have way too many doctors. He also oversaw a $226 million underspend in public education, plus a 3% cut from TAFE. And really, if school kids are so concerned about their education, they should probably grow up and vote. Bard is against same-sex marriage. It's about time a politician had the guts to stand for something overwhelmingly against the wishes of the people. He's also against same-sex couples adopting, which is great because it's better for a child to have no parents than two loving parents who have the same genitals. We don't want to lose another New South Wales Premier to corruption hearings, which is why it's great that Mr Baird is so beyond reproach. Baird appointed Nick DiGirolamo to the State Water Corporation, the same DiGirolamo who later turned that water into wine and the O'Farrell Premiership into garbage. Di Girolamo was appointed to the State Water Corporation despite a report assessing him for a similar position showing he had no relevant industry experience and only narrow legal experience. The now and future Premier has also come under fire for appointing businessman Roger Massey-Green to a $200,000 a year government board following a donation to Baird's election campaign. But if that's corrupt, I'll eat my own hat. And while I'm not wearing a hat, I'm also no longer hungry. What I'm saying is I, I ate my own hat before. Get excited, new New South Wales. We finally have the anti-gay marriage, conservative, manly surfing leader we've been waiting for. There truly is no one like him. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our next guest ran this state for over 10 years and unlike anyone else who has had the job since, left of his own free will. <laughs> Art lover, Pilates disciple and first class statesman, please welcome former Premier, former Minister, Foreign Minister, Bob Carr. Rational fear. There you go, Bob. Actually, Bob. Uh, actually, Bob. That's uh, that's actually not your chair. James, could you just um, get uh, uh, Bob's chair for him? Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's a. <laughs> this is actually this. We actually bought this. This is actually a first-class chair from a Qantas aeroplane, <laughs> from a 747 from about 1991. So, <laughs> welcome, Bob. Well done. Does, does Bob need a microphone or...? Uh, Bob, yeah, Bob does need a microphone, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you, James. Oh, what have you got? What is this? This is... Water. Great, thank you, wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, Bob, I, look, it's really nice to see you again. Um, Pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, last time we were hanging out was, I think, around 1991 at St Gerard's Carlingford Primary School. Um, <laughs> I believe I threw you a really curly question yep. about your no hat, no play policy. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm sure you remember that. Uh, did you do the Premier's reading challenge that year? <laughs> <laughs> I did. Where's, where's my copy? I don't know if you can see the post-it notes of my copy of the book. I only made it to midway through 2012. Um, but I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there. So, Bob, first cab off the rank, first question for you. Will we still get the integrated public transport ticketing system installed for the 2000 Olympics? That's my yeah, big um, question. <laughs> Will that happen? Listen, listen, you, you've had five or six premiers since I was there. <laughs> Ask one of them. Now, speaking of the Olympics, I heard you're not mm. you know, quite exactly the fan of sport and you spent... A significant oh, I, amount of I was time. Born, you can't hold that against me. I was born without a sporting gene. Yeah. Had nothing to do with me. It was just the, the way things came out. Sure, sure. But I heard that you spent most of the Olympics listening to audio books. Is that true? Well, I, I found that you could attend the events <laughs> and <laughs> people, uh, pe people thought I, was, I had a special uh, commentary for the results. <laughs> and, uh, what did you so read? I could watch and educate myself at the same time. Can I, can I just say, I'm so naive, and I'm, hi, you, I've, I've got three favourite premiers of all time. I'm from Victoria, and none of them are Victorian. But it's you, Neville Rand, and Don Dunstan are my three favourite premiers. But I've got to say, I'm so naive, I saw you doing that, I think, 
oh, he probably speaks like French or something in there. He's getting a foreign translation. He's just so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I mean, you do have such a wonderful voice. Have you ever considered doing a audio book of your of your diary? Yeah, I will. Uh, oh. Ruth, I'm interested in it, um, and uh, that means people can can uh, follow the at the Olympics. They, they can listen they to it at the, at the games. Yeah. Would actually, you do the honor? Would you do us the honor now of just maybe reading a paragraph? Um, one of my favorite my favorite uh, paragraphs from the book. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, great. Just yeah. just this one here, uh, November 21, 2012. That'll be great. From just here. here, just here, just there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do it as Bob Carr. <laughs> yeah. Um, Wednesday, November 21, 2012, Canberra. Striding down the corridor of the Press Gallery in Parliament House, I give a cheerful greeting to Laura Tingle, Chief Correspondent of the Australian Financial Review. She replied, Ah, someone in this place who is enjoying himself, you just don't give a fuck what happens. <laughs> From the voice of Bob Carr. Isn't that, isn't that marvellous? Thank you, Bob. I cannot wait to listen to the whole thing during the next Olympics. <laughs> um, tell us more about your voice, because your voice is so great. Paul Keating once said he'd, he'd die for your voice. How did you, come, how did you acquire your amazing voice? Well, I, I, was, I was born without a sporting gene, uh, <laughs> so this was sort of some compensation, I guess. Mm. But did you, did you train? Of course, yeah. 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 Tell us that story. Well, I, I just think if you're a politician, you're, you're giving maybe half a dozen speeches a day, uh, as I did as Premier, and it was, and I mean this seriously, it, was an act, it, would, it would have been an act of contempt for your audience not to learn a bit about modulation and pacing and resonance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I heard... I, is it, true, is, it, is, is, is it true you actually trained with someone from RADA, from the Royal Academy? Yeah, she was wonderful. Uh, yeah. Gina Pirro. Mm. She's, uh, she was a woman with polio. She was a very gifted, gifted teacher. She taught uh, Australian actors how to speak in dialects. And uh, I think Mel Gibson might have had some training when he, when he was required to speak in a, in a dialect, Scotch, Welsh. Um, what she, dialect she did she teach you? <laughs> um, I... I I, I aspire to speak with a neutral Australian accent, mm. not broad and not uh, what, what, what would be called a cultivated mm. Australian accent, classless. And do you, do you feel like that's really helped you in your political career? What did you sound before? What did you sound like before you went to RADA? <laughs> yeah, I had, a, uh, I had uh, a generally a flat, like, like many Australians, a monotone. Can you give, us, there an are many of those... Can you give us an impression of, of pre-trained Bob Carr? <laughs> Even I recognise this wine. <laughs> Your challenge is to try and remember it. No, 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 no. I, I'm allergic to Shiraz. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Especially corrupt Shiraz. <laughs> so, Bob, you must have, like, a heap of copies of this book at home. It's yours. You can pretty much get as many as you want. What's the best non-book function you've found of that book? <laughs> <laughs> like a bludgeon yeah, uh, or a uh, weightlifting uh, implement? Uh, door stopper, yeah. Door stopper. Mm. Are you planning to read Kevin Arad's Diary of a Foreign Minister 2, still ministering? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I, 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 would, I, I would think 80 or 90% of the references to Kevin in this book are favourable. <laughs> I'm just so impressed that I'm hanging out with a graduate of acting school that got a job. <laughs> <laughs> now you get to be premier. <laughs> I'm just hoping I can go... I've got about six of my DVDs backstage. I was going to sell them, but I'm now going to swap one. <laughs> it's a good DVD. I mean, it's, you know, it didn't take that long to write, but it's good. <laughs> And I've been to drama school. But, uh... what, what strikes me about your book is how much you're in love with this new job as, as foreign minister, about how much you actually pinch yourself every time you go into a room to meet with someone yeah, famous. Yeah, there's a bit of that. And because I had a sense that I was only going to be in it for 18 months, yeah. I wanted to capture... <laughs> I, you could have told I us wanted... You were a man who just couldn't give a fuck. Yeah. I wanted, I wanted to capture it in diary form so I could savour it. All of that. I mean, if, if I'd been in the job for five years, which would have been better, better for the country, for me, for the world, for humanity, for suffering humanity, <laughs> then, then oh, I, uh, I could have let things take care of themselves. But, oh. but for my own sake, I wanted to keep a record like this, 18 months as foreign minister. Um, your book... 
now uh, oh, someone just said, what about yeah. Julian Assange? So, yeah. what about him? <laughs> well, he's... Uh... He's here tonight! <laughs> <laughs> Behind this red curtain, <laughs> Julian Assange! No, no, not here. He's, uh, he's in the... Oh, I'll say this about him. He's, he's in the Ven Venezuelan embassy in London. Not because of anything we've done or failed to do, but because of an argument with the Swedish public prosecutor. He got transferred we've got We've got no standing. We've got no standing in that case. Uh, the Swedish prosecutor won in the courts of the UK, and as a result, he's up for extradition and seeking refuge in the embassy. My own view is that he's been there for too long, and it would be appropriate, simply based on the humanity of the case, for the Swedish public prosecutor to beat a path to the Venezuelan embassy and interview him there. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> oh, uh, some people but are yelling not, Ecuador. Not, you said it, Venezuelan. Uh, did I? Have, yeah, Ecuadorian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's not some. It's not. A, it's not an argument in which we've got standing, and we sure. can't make that happen. You, you talk about people who've been there too long. I want to talk a little bit about boat people now. Look, yeah. As foreign minister, um, you you bumped into Tony Abbott in the corridors at Chifley. And you gave him some advice. What advice did you give him oh, regarding... Let me guess. No, no. Oh, no. no my, my, my advice was this, and the, the background to it is that I, unlike Tony Abbott, would like Australia to lift, to lift its refugee intake by taking people from the camps. And I believe the big impediment to that, the big impediment to that is a people smuggling racket that got out of hand. When you had in, in 2013 a monthly intake from people smugglers, arrivals at Christmas Island, equivalent on an annualised rate, an annualised rate to about 20 or 30% of Australia's annual immigration. That was unsustainable. So, hence my argument that we had to, we had to have offshore processing, although I would make it a good deal more humane than what has been delivered by Scott Morrison. And you probably tell people about it as well. <laughs> well, what? Yeah, well, I, th I think I think this is unsustainable. Why not I mean, onshore process? The previous Labor government, the previous Labor government, had attempted to do that, and had said to the media of Australia, "We're not going to tell you how many are coming this month. You're not entitled to that information." There would have been an indictment of the government of the day in all the in all the uh, in all the the, the, the media. Um, I can't believe that they got away with it. Now, Bob, uh, we've got to, we're going to wrap this up because sure. uh, we're, we're at the top of the hour. Um, before we do that, we just want to just do a, a really fast-paced question and answer because yep. BuzzFeed have outsourced an article to us. Um, so <laughs> this article is called 12 Travel Tips for, for Foreign Ministers. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's hit it. All right, you ready? You ready? Let's hit it. Best hotel? Carlisle, New York, because of the Kennedy Association. <laughs> Best airline? Qantas. <laughs> Meditation or Pilates? Uh, Pilates is easier. <laughs> Meditation is more elusive. <laughs> Favourite foreign minister? Marty Natalagawa. <laughs> it seems like you have a crush on Marty Natalagawa. I... I think he's pretty good. Yeah, I think he's a very yeah. nice guy. He's, yeah. a, he's the original hipster. But I, 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 I didn't call him Johnny Deep. That was Julia who said that. <laughs> okay, very good. Johnny Deep. <laughs> Marubra or Moscow? Oh, Marubra. <laughs> Best, tra oh, seen, sorry, best Shakespeare that represents the current political climate. <laughs> Richard III. <laughs> this, one, uh, this one got sent in from Kevin Rudd, and the question goes, Kevin Rudd, great Secretary General or greater Secretary General? <laughs> I, th I think a lot of the General Assembly would respond to the good things about Rudd's agenda. Climate change, protecting the marine environment, arms trade treaty, nuclear non-proliferation, and the apology, because that resonated around the world, and uh, there are even nations in the Caribbean, 14 of them, that said, we're going to vote, Australia, uh, vote for Australia for the Security Council because we like those things, especially the apology. There you go. All right, final question, Premier. What is the best gift you've ever received as Premier without declaring it? <laughs> you yeah. can pass if you want. You can pass if you want. <laughs> yeah, someone gave me, someone gave me a, uh, a reproduction of a history book I'd been given as a five-year-old called The Australia Book. It introduced me to history and to the history of this country. And I'll never forget the first sentence. The earliest Australians had been in the land so long that not even the oldest among them could remember how they got there 
or when they first arrived. <laughs> and someone, someone re reproduced the Australia book, and when I opened it, on my desk as Premier, it brought back memories of me learning for the first time as a kid in Maroubra about the history of Australia, and in that first, in that first sentence of the book, of the first Australians. Thanks, Bob. That's terrific. That's really great. Terrific. <laughs> Bob, thank you for a first-class interview. And as a parting gift, here is a box of goon from Irrational Fear. Um, <laughs> There's no thank you card needed for that one. Uh, that, one that, one, that one's for you. Hang on, just stay here. And before we go, ladies and gentlemen, before we go, Hannah Mae Riley has the fearsome fears or what we should be afraid of next week. Joe Hockey says new Medicare bulk billing fee is fair because most long-term medical conditions were incurred under the previous Labor government. <laughs> Monikers support their argument by pointing to the future King George's recent speech, Goo Goo Gaga, as being just as statesmanlike as any of our current leaders. In the USA, the Democrats set up a fundraising committee for Chelsea Clinton's unborn child to run for president in 2056. This is a rational fear. It's produced and hosted by Dan Lilly. This episode is written by James Colley, Dave Bluestein, Hannah Mae Riley, Cameron James, Jenny Fricker, A.O. Taylor, Dylan Bain, Mark Humphreys, Ed Coba, Alex Fraser, Alex Cabot, Jared McGrath, and me. Thanks to our guests, Alex Fraser, James Breckney, Lewis Hobber, James Colley, Anna Mae Riley. Uh, is that it? Bob Carr. Almost forgot Bob Carr. Terrible. Special thanks to D D uh, Dylan Bolicle, Beth, Harvey, Smash, Pat, Vito, uh, Xerian, the Giant Wolf, Pete and Brian, Emotion Picture Company, and thanks to our boss at FBI Radio, Caroline Gates, follow Smash Appear on social media. Until next week, there's so many things to be scared of. Good night! Yeah.